Good morning. Uh, my guest today is David Schuler, who is superintendent of High School District 214 in Illinois. Good morning, David. Good morning, Doug. Great to be with you. Uh, likewise. Uh, Dave is past president of the American Association of School Administrators. I believe that was in 2015-16. Correct. And was 2018 AASA Superintendent of the Year. We're talking about AASA's uh, Aspiring Superintendents Academy. And why don't we kick off, Dave, by um, <clears throat> you're giving us uh, an overview of the Academy, uh, why it was this created, uh, its basic goals, and uh, how it operates, how it functions. Sure. So um, the Aspiring Superintendents Academy was really started as a way to create a pipeline into the superintendency. We were few, seeing fewer and fewer individuals applying across the country uh, for superintendency <clears throat> positions. And, you know, I just think at the end of the day, being a superintendent is the best job in the country. Uh, we're one of the largest employers in our community. Who else has the opportunity to enact change like we do? We have the opportunity to create the next generation of global citizens. And so, you know, it, because of my joy and love for the position, you know, I reached out and asked AASA if we could launch an aspiring academy. And we now have a bunch of different aspiring academies that exist, which is just awesome. Um, and so we're in probably our fifth year now of running our aspiring superintendent academies. Um, the, we have one that meets um, in person and blended during normal times, Doug. Um, <laughs> but uh, these are clearly not normal times. So most of our meetings through the end of December are all virtual. Um, but we really provide opportunities for individuals either at a state level, we have some state specific programs, or at a national level, which is the program that I lead, um, to prepare people to be successful in the role. And one of the things I'm most excited about is out of, you know, five cohorts worth of participants, we've only had one person attain a superintendency and not maintain their position. And that was an individual that I had said during the interview process, run, that board needs help. They need Doug to come in and work with them. Get run, <laughs> run, run. But he was sure he could fix the board. And as you know, superintendents, especially in their first year, definitely can't fix a board. Right. It's a dangerous time, high yeah. risk time that first year. Well, you're, I believe, lead teacher. That's your official title in addition to being chief executive of district 214 um what what does lead teacher mean what what's your role so my role involves planning the agendas but more importantly finding out where each of the participants are at because everybody's at a different point in their life journey and their professional career so it's important for me to find out does someone want to become a superintendent next year or does someone want to become a superintendent in two or three years, you know? And then once we know that information, we can kind of chart a personalized pathway to each individual for their superintendency journey. And then, you know, really working to find out, you know, what is their leadership concept, right? What is their construct for leadership? Through their graduate work, you know, who do they look to as kind of the guideposts for, not just education, but leadership. And once we have that piece figured out, then we can really create these problems of practice and capstone projects that really ensure that we're focusing on, you know, every session we focus a little bit, at least a little bit on board relations. Because as I think you would agree, that relationship between the board and the superintendent is just so mission critical. And we have a lot of colleagues who end up losing their jobs between years seven and 11 because they take their eye off the prize of board relationships, you know? And mm -hmm. I think you, you just can never take your eye off of building that relationship with the board. And then focusing on other things, you know, a lot of people come up through the curriculum area and through that, you know, an assistant superintendent for teaching and learning or curriculum. Well, they need to know how to create a budget. They need mm -hmm. to understand the legal aspects. So we do a lot of making sure we're rounding out kind of the toolbox that is 
their skill set to allow them to walk into a superintendency with some humility, but also some confidence that they know they can do the job. Well, you mentioned board superintendent relations as one of the key factors uh, affecting the superintendent's performance and success. Um, I've been under the impression, and I think you and I have talked about this in the past, that even today, despite the importance of that relationship, uh, formal graduate education, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, schools of education are not yet addressing that. Is Am I right that that's still not? I would, I would completely agree with that. Uh, completely. Why? Why? I don't know. I don't know. And I think, you know, a lot of schools of education have retired superintendents who may have been in the role for a while and they may have taken some of those board relationships for granted. But, you know, I'm in my 21st year of being a superintendent and I spend just as much time now working with my board as I did in year one in this district. And I think, you know, it's really interesting when you ask aspiring academy um, participants, how much time do you think you spend, you'll, you'll spend with a board? And they're like, oh, maybe 10, 15%. And I'm like, you better be spending over 50% of your time focusing on board relations. Keep your resume updated. Exactly, exactly. Now, if I were interviewing you for, let's say, the New York Times or Wall Street Journal about the Academy, what would you point to as its notable achievements since it was founded? Or the various academies, uh, aspiring superintendent academies uh, around the country, what, what have been the accomplishments thus far? I think probably what I'm most proud of is that the data point that I mentioned earlier, that out of five cohorts worth of mm -hmm. superintendent, aspiring superintendents, we've only had one not get and retain their job. When we know the life expectancy of a superintendent in, in a district is somewhere in that two to four year kind of range, that we are providing the skills. And what I think is so critical, and I should have mentioned this before, Doug, is that network right? We, we're creating this cohort, this collaborative, this community, and we keep people together. So, you know, next week I've got a meeting with last year's aspiring academy graduates. So we keep people together and say, okay, what is your experience? What do you guys need? What, if, what did you not know as you've tried to start the school year off, right? And so I think, you know, the superintendency can be a very lonely position, but only if you allow it to be, which is what I love about AASA. I love about the different cohorts and networks that we're building. Cause you know, during this, I mean, these are clearly unprecedented times. I need to rely on other people to help me in my leadership moving forward. And, you know, it helps when different people in different regions take the lead, you know? And so others went remote before we did and others announced that they were starting the year remote before we did. But last Friday, I was the first to put out our metrics for our region and how we're going to return to school. And so we talked about that as a network of superintendents and said, all right, I've got 21 years in, 16 in the district. I'm going to take the arrows on this one. And then you guys can decide what you want to do based on that. You know? And so I think, I think what I would say is before COVID, we communicated a lot as superintendents. And that's what we talk a lot with the Aspiring Academy. Since COVID, we've collaborated on an entire, entirely different level. It is a complete, mm -hmm. we used to be very competitive with each other. And now there is this sense that we are all in this together and we have to, it's the, it's the way we're going to get through this. And you know, what I tell our aspiring Academy superintendents all the time is this has been the hardest I have ever worked. Uh, I, I can't tell you the last time I went to bed before midnight. I, I literally can't tell you that, but there's no place I'd rather be. There's no seat I would rather be in than that of a superintendent. I can't imagine not being a superintendent during these times and not have the opportunity and the privilege and the honor to help my school community through this to the other side, to see that the sun rise again, you know? And so to be able to share that with a group of aspiring people who may look at their superintendent and be like, do I really want to do that? That's such a privilege for me. 
I, I love this opportunity as exhausting as it is, you know, um, I, there's just, there's no place I'd rather be. So to be able to inspire, hopefully, and motivate others to want to step into this chair is just a, one of the greatest, it's the, what I love to do more than anything besides being a superintendent is to work with our aspiring academies. Speaking of the academies, uh, let's go back to a couple of the nuts and bolts. I'm not sure we covered. Now, uh, explain the concept of the cohort. How large is a co any particular cohort? So we look to keep our cohorts between 15 and about 23 or 24 because we really want that ability for them to connect and really get to know and trust each other. You know, we say, look, this, this is a cone of silence. So I may know your superintendent and in most cases I probably do. When we get into the aspiring Academy, this is all about you. This is about your development and you have the ability to share whatever you need to share. And I'm keeping that within this group. So what's the time commitment of these 15 to 20 some? Yep. So we aspirants. Right, exactly. So mm -hmm. in the National Academy, we start off in July and being virtual, we do two four hour sessions because we've just found that that allows people to maintain their day job and not wear people out. I, I know some people do eight hour Zooms. I just, I, I struggle Ooh. with keeping up that energy for the eight hours. Uh, you eight know. hours. Okay. So we do two four day half sessions and then um, we do that in uh, July, February, and May. And then every month we take 90 minutes and deliver some curriculum, uh, some content, allow them to meet with their mentors. We have mentors for each, uh, for every um, aspiring mm -hmm. academy participant. Um, and then, and that ends up working out really, really well. Um, and then we have, we do have some state specific programs. Like Montana has a program that I've worked with them to develop because it's hard for them when we're in person. You know, if you're in a remote district with, you know, I was talking with one superintendent a couple weeks ago, she has 16 kids in her district, you know, so graduation, when she had two graduates, she could pull that off, you know, where with us having, you know, 500 graduates, you just can't do that with social distancing. So, um, you know, that looks a little different. That's much more virtual um, traditionally, just because it's hard to get to, you know, we're working with uh, Washington mm -hmm. State with Alaska on building a program, which will be much more remote even when you can get together. Um, you know, Alaska has seen such a turnover in their superintendents and they have such a great state superintendent association. It's really providing just the content and the resources to help them in a situation that looks very, very different than being in suburban Chicago. I'm curious, you're superintendent of a large high school district and you're obviously very engaged. Um, in the aspiring superintendents academies around the country, not only the national. Um, how are you able not to sleep? You obviously are not sleeping and yet you look remarkably healthy. Um, well, I, knew, I knew when this all started, if I was gonna be able to continue at the pace I needed to keep up, I needed to make some dietary changes. And, uh, and so I've lost about 40 pounds uh, oh, since yeah. February. And, uh, and I, I don't get as much sleep as I probably should. Um, but that's okay right now. That's okay. It's, it's okay. Because again, the opportunity we have to build high quality superintendent pipelines, like that, that drives me. It, so I wake up, even though I may be tired, I'm energized. I'm energized to do the work, you know? And I think, and talking with a lot of my colleagues, they feel the exact same way. My, the bags under my eyes are, are getting bigger and bigger, but it's okay, <laughs> right? It's okay. As long as it doesn't go on indefinitely. Correct, correct. Yeah. So a final question. As you think back, on your experience with uh, the National Academy and the academies around the country. What have been the uh, uh, most important lessons thus far that you and your colleagues have, have learned? By far the biggest lesson I learned was helping somebody get back in the application process after they did not get their first superintendency job. 
So they go through the interview process. These people are aspiring academy participants have all been very successful in their careers. Most of them have not been told no very often as they've moved through the ranks, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first time that they're told no, there is with a number of them, well, I think I'm done, I'm good, I'm just gonna stay where I am. And that was a huge aha for me and a huge lesson that I learned that I really had to focus on the resiliency and teaching the resiliency of it's okay, get back in the game, right? And this is why you maybe didn't get the position and it had zero to do with you, you know? And I have one individual who, you know, went head to head against an internal candidate in two different searches and lost both of those jobs. And I said, well, I think what that tells you is you need to ask a question to the search consultant, is there an internal candidate, right? Because you don't want to be that person who ends up losing four or five jobs all to internal candidates, and then you just become that candidate that gets slated, right? Because search firms are looking to slate candidates to boards, right? And I want right. people to actually get the job. And so being intentional about teaching that resiliency is not something I expected when I started, but something that... Um, I find has been very helpful as we move throughout the process. And then the other thing is just thinking through um, the impact of gender and race on different search processes and being honest and open about talking with candidates, you know, about, you know, different board makeups and board presidents and who board presidents tend to hire. Um, and so just thinking through all of those kind of things, I think um, those components and characteristics, I think is just fascinating. And I love to do that because I want to set people up for success. You know, and like that case I talked about, I remember we were at O'Hare as a family getting ready to take a family trip. And I said, I am telling you, you don't walk from this search, you run. They had <laughs> five member board, two members were not there for the final interview and they went and those two rogue board members went and did site visits in the three finalist town without telling the other three board members that that's what they were doing. Well, that's dysfunction for you. Right? So I'm like, I'm telling you, don't walk, run. And he's like, no, I can fix it. I'm like, you're not going to fix it. And he lasted less than uh, 18 months. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I can't do anything else but tell you, let's help you find another landing page, you know? What have you found to be the biggest challenge during the first year for new superintendents? So what I tell new superintendents all the time is your board is going to be excited for you to make change, but be very careful about the level of change you make because the changes you make are going to draw judgment on their past practice. And so I say all the time, listen, ask a lot of questions, do, go around. And when you do those listening sessions, when you do that tour, that opening tour, don't ask them people what they want to change. Because you know what? They're going to tell you. I always say, I always start with, tell me the best thing about our district. That's what I want to know. Because the people that are going to come and tell you everything that's wrong are going to come for sure. But even they must have something positive to say. So you can mm -hmm. ground your whole conversation then in the positives. So when you report back to your board about those opening, you know, uh, listening sessions, it can be, this is, these are the strengths I heard about our district. And all that does is that's going to make the board feel great. And I also, I've been a superintendent in three districts, and I always say the same thing. My first meeting with the board, I said, look, it is going to take us a little while to hit our cadence of communication. So I would like quarterly the first year to do a closed session to talk about my goals and evaluate me to make sure I'm communicating with the level of information you need, right? And so I was a superintendent in a small farming community that had one grocery store and one gas station. And that board wanted to hear whatever they were gonna hear if they stopped and picked up a gallon of milk at the gas station that happened in school that day. Right. So I would often go down to the gas station and tell Deb, who was the cashier, anything that happened. So she'd have the factual information rather than the rumors. You know, oh my gosh, I got to the <laughs> I second, love it. I love that it. Great? My second district, it was a sprawling geographic area. And we had a bus accident on the first day of school, of course. Right. Like a bus accident, my very first day. So I called my board president and I said, we, there was a bus accident. I just want you to know. And she said, Dave, was anybody hurt? And are there TV cameras there? And I said, no, everybody's okay. She said, then why are you calling me with that information? 
right? <laughs> and then I got done to my current district, you know, and I said, we just need to have those open communications so that I will, I will figure it out within six months, but it's not fair to you or to me to not indicate if I'm oversharing or undersharing. So I think first year superintendents appreciate that. And then the other thing I would just say, sorry for this long winded answer, but I think it's really important for superintendents to adjust their leadership style to the board president. And I think too often we allow or we expect board presidents to adapt to us right. and it has to be the other way. It just has to be, you know, and I look, my first superintendency, we had a wonderful board president, just wonderful. He was a farmer and he would lean forward and he would call the agenda item. And then he would sit back in his chair and I would facilitate the discussion. When the discussion was done, I would lean back. That was his cue to lean forward and call the vote. So I left that district, the new superintendent came in and he said, this is a meeting of the board. And so it's up to the board to run the meeting. That wasn't that, super, that board president's skill set, you know? So their meetings started ending up going till 2, 3 a.m. and almost all the incumbents got voted out the next election. That wasn't the fault of that board, right? right. It was the fault of that superintendent not adjusting. When I got to my next district, that board president that I just mentioned who talk, said, if the cameras don't come, don't call, you know, she said, Dave, this is a meeting of the board and I will run the meeting. When we want your input or when asked a question, I will direct that question to you. Awesome. That was fine. Okay. She yeah. left, right? So she left and we had just another great board president, but he was kind of like, he was so brilliant. He was kind of like an absent-minded professor. So he would be talking and his mind was racing and then he would forget what was coming out of his mouth. So he would just stop <laughs> mid-sentence. So in that case, I was, I was on guard. I always had to be ready to finish his <laughs> sentence, never knowing when he was going to stop. Right? <laughs> and then in my current district, you know, I've had um, a board president who wants to talk every day before 830, but we have to hang up before 830 because he's a, a little on the, he's, he's not a young man and his daughter calls at 830 every day to make sure he's still alive. So I have to talk to him before 8.30. When I had, and we rotate board presidents every two years in my current district. I had a CPA who was board president. And he's like, look, unless somebody dies, do not call me between January and April. You know? <laughs> so that's my job as the soup to adapt my style to that board president Absolutely. style. And Absolutely. And so, so I'm sure you teach. Time. This is what you teach your That's exactly what we teach and spend a lot of time talking about. Great. Well, I've really enjoyed talking with you, Dave, about the um, Spiring Superintendents Academy. Thanks for taking the time. Of course. And um, let's plan on a part two somewhere down the pike. That sounds great, so, I Meanwhile, that with you. have a safe and satisfying day and take care of yourself. And thanks, you too. Thanks again. You bet. Bye.